but I think also on the UK side, uh, there has uh, been a, a lack of honesty about what Brexit means and about the trade-offs uh, that it involves uh, for people, for businesses, uh, and for Northern Ireland uh, in particular. Uh, on Northern Ireland, uh, I don't believe there was any magical thinking that, have got, uh, that could have got us out of the uh, uh, conundrum uh, that we found ourselves in. Uh, we had to face a fundamental uh, choice uh, between a as it were, a customs border that ran across territory or uh, down the Irish Sea. And there was no way of avoiding that, uh, in my view. But I do believe uh, that there was and is room uh, for the creation of a light border <laughs> as opposed to a heavy uh, border. Uh, if both sides approach the issue in a... Um, a pragmatic and a, and a creative uh, a spirit, but based on a relationship of trust, which has got now to be built up. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, the UK's reputation um, as a sort of responsible international uh, uh, actor, I think, was damaged uh, from the uh, outset, from the moment we. Uh, uh, left the European Union. I think this was done in a sort of needless, almost willful way. We can come back uh, to why if we uh, want. But, you know, building trust between the, the UK and the EU after Brexit was not, in my view, a priority uh, for the then uh, uh, Prime Minister. On the EU side, I would say that there has been too little thinking um, about what kind of relationship the EU wants with the UK uh, in the future. You know, we are not a normal third country. I know what a normal third country is uh, with the European Union. I used to negotiate with them. I used to negotiate trade agreements with them. You know, we're not a normal third country. We are a very large former uh, member uh, of the EU with a very big economy sitting right on the border uh, of, of the EU, and that creates all sorts of unique uh, tensions and frictions that have got to be overcome uh, by constant dialogue uh, and collaboration. I think the European Union is now beginning to um, think more about the relationship that it wants uh, with the UK, um, including uh, of course, how the Northern Ireland Protocol problems can be resolved intelligently. Um, but I have to say that based on my contacts with my former uh, colleagues in, in, in Brussels, um, there are a lot of doubts about whether the UK, or rather the UK government, is a, you know, is a stable or reliable interlocutor uh, for the EU it seems to change and roll around and sort of go off in different directions. People don't know who and what uh, they are uh, uh, dealing with. So I'd say in conclusion that you know, we badly need a normalised relationship between the UK uh, and the EU, and we've got to stop giving the European Union excuses not to think constructively about the relationship they want with the UK. Uh, we need to put aside the confrontational tactics that were employed in the negotiation uh, for the uh, TCA uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the sort of sovereigntist game playing um, uh, that, in my view, uh, has characterised Britain's approach uh, up until now, that is, since the TCA uh, uh, was agreed. I think we need to reaffirm that the European Union and its member states are very important partners uh, for, for us uh, because it is only through working with them, amongst others in the world, that we're going to deal uh, with the most pressing political and economic challenges that we face as a nation.
Thank you very much. You touched on a large number of points there, and I'm glad to say we're coming back to quite a few of them as we progress through the questions. The other side of the coin, Lord Frost, is, is from you. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman, and thanks for the, the opportunity to, to come and give evidence. Um, actually, I, I agree with you know, probably about 50% of what uh, Lord Mandelson has, has said, and um, I'll, I'll, um, it'll become apparent which 50% uh, that is. <laughs> um, I, I, the way I would characterise the relationship, as far as I can tell, um, is that it is cool um, it's quite fragile, but it is not notably improving over the last few months. It's nowhere near where we would want it to be yet, obviously. I think there are two reasons why uh, this is happening. One, um, obviously, the Ukraine war uh, has produced um, a sense of solidarity and Britain's um, importance to the security and defence of the continent has been reinforced. And I think our ability to um, uh, get ahead, perhaps, of some others in uh, responding to the challenges that were presented has been noticed um, and welcomed in at least part of the, the continent, perhaps all of it by now. Um, and I think the second reason is that we just have a, a general settling down of things, which I always thought would happen, said that a few times. People are getting used to the new relationship, some of the new institutions are, uh, are, are in place, meetings are happening, we, we are getting used to it, and I think as, uh, as a result uh, it's beginning to feel more normal. Um, there are plenty of things that could still upset this, uh, obviously. Um, I agree Northern Ireland is the, the major problem and it's quite hard to see the relationship getting anywhere near where we want it to be until that problem is, is fixed. Um, there are other issues which could become problems this autumn and I, I think um, uh, you know, a, lot of a lot is said about trust on our side but I think we also will need to look at how the EU handles certain issues itself. I mean, one obvious example is the energy interconnectors and decisions that may or may not be taken about them uh, if we get to a crisis point uh, as regards energy supply later on this autumn. Um, so there are plenty of things where it could, it could, um, it could uh, get worse, but I hope that both sides will manage to, to find a way through this and, and rise above it. Um, just a couple of final remarks. I'm sure we'll go into it in more detail, but Northern Ireland, um, uh, as I said, that, that needs to be fixed. It needs to be got onto a more durable basis. It, the, that more durable basis must involve a shift in the current arrangement so that Northern Ireland is more fully part of the UK single market for goods and regulation. It's better if that's negotiated, obviously, but there needs to I be a serious shift. Um, and uh, I, I think an important part of that is that the Court of Justice um, cannot have a jurisdictional or arbitrational role uh, in the future arrangements. I can't see how they would be stable uh, while that remained the case. I think it'd be better if that was acknowledged uh, sooner rather than later. I think, just to finish, um, uh, Lord Anderson's right that things could have been done differently, I think, all along by, by both sides. And... Um, uh, it's hardly surprising that mistakes were made in an, in an unprecedented process. I would um, say that I think if there is a failure of trust, and there probably is uh, a bit, um, that both sides are to some extent responsible for that. There are things that the European Union and its member states have done in the last two or three years which have very seriously shaken trust on the UK side as well. And um, we need to put that behind us uh, and we need to find solutions which can last. And I hope we can get through this winter, find a Northern Ireland solution and move on to something better. Well, thank you. And that also unpacks quite a few things that we will we'll come back to in the evidence session. And in fact, it's a very <coughs> good segue into Lord Hannay and his questions. Lord Hannay. Yes, well, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, um, I think both uh, witnesses have actually covered rather fully the um, 
preliminary remarks I was going to put to them about how the dispute in over Northern Ireland Protocol is the main cause of a lack of progress in the relationship, UK-EU relationship, uh, and as, as it were, contaminated many other fields as well. And I don't particularly want to go over that again, because I think you've both rather fully answered that. Um, and you've, I think, given some answers to um, the second part of the question I was going to ask, which was what form such a, a resolution of the um, negotiations might take. But uh, could I just uh, ask you both to comment on one part of the dispute, which is this, um, the involvement of the European Court of Justice uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, and to reflect on where, is it not the case that in the EFTA countries, for example, which are in the single market, uh, they have a system of uh, dealing with disputes called the EFTA court, which is subordinate to the European Court of Justice. So there's nothing particularly unusual about this. Uh, and uh, could you not, uh, could you find, not find it a bit difficult for the EU to ever accept that disputes relating to the application of single market law in Northern Ireland should not be, should be the only part of the single market which was not covered by the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice? Well, um, uh, where to start on, on that? Um, I think there is a crucial distinction uh, between the EFTA uh, countries and others, um, uh, though I don't think the situation is quite as clear-cut on the court as you presented, Lord, Lord Hannay, particularly as regards Switzerland and the role of the court. Um, but didn't refer to Switzerland. No, well, um, that, that is the one that's um, referred to very, very often in this context. I think uh, the crucial difference is that Northern Ireland, um, as we know, um, is a fragile, uh, the politics in Northern Ireland are fragile, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is a crucial element of making those um, uh, arrangements work, and the normal EU tools that it uses to um, enforce its laws uh, beyond its borders uh, are not suitable for the politics of Northern Ireland, and we, we worried about this when we um, accepted the protocol in 2019 um, and I think we were right to worry about it because we discovered that the EU's first reaction to a problem was to immediately open infraction processes and they've been paused and now reopened uh, again and I, I think it is never going to be suitable for the Northern Irish environment to have that sort of um, knee-jerk approach to dispute resolution. The protocol does, of course, include another arrangement, which is uh, more normal arbitration as well as the court. And I think if the EU had used that first in the case of these disputes, we might be in a different position. But I, I think it is now too, it's now too fragile um, for us to accept the use of the court and its mechanisms in this uh, very complex environment. I think we've just learned by experience that it, it won't work. And I know, of course, I appreciate that the court is, uh, the, the EU's doctrine on the court is what it is, um, but nevertheless, uh, it has taken on with us a shared role in trying to make the Good Friday Agreement and Northern Ireland politics work. And I think it should be willing to look at uh, its doctrine in that light. Well, Trevor, my view is that uh, if we have reached that position of fragility that Lord Frost describes, it is, it is because uh, the Prime Minister at the time um, signed up to the arrangements in Northern Ireland uh, in bad faith. Uh, and it is certain that he consistently failed to tell the truth about them to the people of Northern Ireland. Now, I know the people of Northern Ireland. I was their Secretary of State. 
at the time when my responsibility was to implement the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. I mean, signing it was one thing. It was then stillborn for well over a year uh, before it was implemented and, uh, and, and that I was able to achieve along with other uh, political leaders in Northern Ireland uh, with the assistance of George, Senator George Mitchell. Uh, and everything is always fragile and you know, yes, nothing is ideally suited for the politics of Northern Ireland. Uh, that I can tell you, you know, for sure, just about, about every single dimension. And that's why you have to use creativity and flexibility uh, in how you manage uh, these sensitivities um, uh, in the politics of Northern Ireland. And in my view, um, uh, it is a, a direct sort of consequence or extension uh, of the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, that uh, we uh, have to find uh, an appropriate way in which uh, European law is maintained and there is an appropriate role uh, for the ECJ or some judicial, European judicial process uh, that, that operates uh, there as a direct result of the protocol which this government negotiated and agreed. And the European Union will find a flexible way, it will find uh, a way of adapting um, how it uh, operates the rule of law in the most sensitive way that takes into full account uh, the as Lord Frost says, the politics of Northern Ireland. <clears throat> but I can, I'm absolutely sure of one thing, and that is that if the British government presses down hard uh, uh, on these uh, um, um, uh, issues of um, sovereignty as opposed to the most expeditious, smooth, uninterrupted flow of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is where I think we should focus, if instead uh, the British government chooses to make uh, these other sort of sovereignty, in quotes, issues uh, their sticking point, then we'll be back to square one and we will not get anywhere. Thank you very much, Lord Hannay. You had a, a further question. Thank you. I, I, there, there was a further question not to do with Northern Ireland, which I gave notice to Lord Frost, and I would like to put to him, uh, <clears throat> which is that after he left the government, um, he made a speech, which um, I certainly read with interest, in which he referred to the British government's position on um, performing artists and the difficulties that... Brexit has brought to that sector, that rather important, lively sector of our economy, and had said that the approach by the government had been, quote, too purist, unquote. I wonder if I could ask him to expand a little bit on what he thinks the way out of the impasse we've got into, and perhaps taking in also the issue of the complete collapse of intra-school uh, visits uh, as a result of the application of our visa regime, uh, because these are appallingly damaging. They are a subject we are going to be considering in our uh, analysis of the future of UK relations, and it'd be very valuable to have a few words from him on that now. I'm sorry, not <coughs> Manson, but if he'd like to come in on it, but it is one on which Lord Frost has personally expressed a view. Yes, um, very happy to. Um, uh, yeah, in my uh, Zurich uh, speech, the Churchill Lecture, um, I, I, I said two things, really. One is I, 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 I thought then, and I think now, that there is room for a significant bargain between us and the EU. It must, of course, take in a settlement of, on Northern Ireland. It could take in... Um, uh, closer arrangements on foreign policy cooperation, for example, and it could take in uh, migration <laughs> movement issues. But of course, it could take in other things uh, uh, as well um, in the interest of finding the right balance. And I think that is still possible. So at that level, um, a settlement is possible within one level down, if you like, uh, within the migration set of issues. 
it's you know it is a pity that it wasn't possible to solve these um, issues during the talks in 2020. Um, the atmosphere uh, was not such as to make it possible, I think, on either side. There was a bit of scooping out of some of these issues, but in the end, um, it didn't work uh, for for a mix of reasons. Um, as you say, there's the issue of musicians' visas, <coughs> there's the issue of school visas on our side, there's the issue of... I mean, there are a number of other irritants, if you like, the difference between the Schengen visa of 90 days in 180 and hours of 180 in 360. There is the use of uh, e-gates at airports and so on and so on, practical <coughs> issues. Uh, and I think it ought to be possible to, to fix those. I don't myself see why we couldn't agree a narrow um, visa waiver arrangement covering defined categories of musicians and actors and so on provided it wasn't permanent forever and and could be um uh had an exit clause could be renegotiated could be flexible according to events but i'm sure that that ought to be possible so i i, I feel if the relationship warms up generally these things are possible in our mind i think they could have been possible even in 2020 but uh, events just didn't make it possible. Lord Mandelson, did you want to comment on that? It's simply that, you know, if it's so simple, why on earth could it not have been agreed at the time in 2020? Why were, why were the relationships allowed to become so cool in Lord Frost's uh, terms that we couldn't even, you know, grasp that low-hanging fruit? And mutual recognition of professional qualifications is another. The sooner we get the uh, mechanisms and the working groups and parties of the TCA, of, of which there are, I think, at least 30, you know, operating, uh, then I think there are all manner of things uh, that, that can be opened up and which we should uh, grasp, uh, but we need the relationship to work, and it won't work until we've resolved the Northern Ireland Protocol. Could I, Chairman, could I just come back on one point on that, which is, um, uh, I think it's important to remember in those last few months of the negotiation, um, A, obviously the atmosphere was not ideally as we would have wished for, for a mix of reasons, but second, COVID. Uh, a lot of the talks, even um, in those last few months, were conducted remotely. They were constantly breaking down because one or other of us will get a positive test. We were not able to get within two metres of our interlocutors. So the normal defusing, exploring conversations simply could not take place. And I think that is one of the reasons that now uh, we've all moved on. We've forgotten that that actually was quite a major constraint in getting things done. Thank you very much. Lord Lamont wanted to come in here. I just wanted to ask uh, Lord Mandelson a question. You um, warned of the danger of placing too much emphasis on sovereignty issues as opposed to the flow of goods, and obviously I understand that in a practical sense, but in emphasising this, isn't the government reflecting just the views of the unionist community, and isn't that their paramount concern, issues like the ECJ, and given that one has to give equal weight to the two communities in Northern Ireland, isn't this inevitably going to be a consideration? Yes. Uh, I agree. We do need to give consideration to the feelings and sensitivities of the unionist community, and I uh, happen to believe uh, that uh, for both the European Union and the UK, I, I suspect both of them, uh, had they thought about it, would have realised uh, that this uh, protocol, once it hit the realities, the political realities of Northern Ireland, was not going to work exactly as they were envisaging or pretending that they were signing up to in the case of the UK. So <clears throat> I'm very conscious of those. But equally, um, uh, unionists in Northern Ireland uh, want the uh, economy of Northern Ireland to work in the best possible way. There are trade-offs, therefore, between economic efficiency, trade, the flow of goods, uh, in which actually as a result of the Nor uh, Northern Ireland Protocol and the arrangements that have been made for Northern Ireland places Northern Ireland in a very advantageous position vis-a-vis uh, -vis both the 
uh, European market uh, and the uh, domestic uh, UK market. And unionists are very conscious of that. They listen to those uh, 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 who are directly engaged in this trade and who have very strong business and employment interests and they know that they are going to have to uh, 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 sign up to a trade-off uh, between, as I would put it, sovereigntist uh, 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 issues uh, and uh, the advantages uh, of trade and the movement of goods. But I would say, it, where it is possible uh, to uh, find uh, some flexibility in relation to the sovereignty issues, taxation, state aid, um, ECJ, uh, etc., um, the European Union should go the extra mile uh, to do so. But what I said was that if the British government chose to press down hard on those issues and make them the stumbling blocks, then we will be back to square one. Thank you very much. Well, we will begin to m moving a bit now into looking more um, forward <clears throat> to things. And so I move to Lord Tuckenhat. Uh, I have a question for Lord Frost, but really to some extent both his answers and Lord Mandelson's <coughs> have cast light on it. But my question is whether he thinks the institutional structures which were set up under the withdrawal agreement and under the TCA have operated in the manner envisaged by the UK government when the respective agreements were signed. I imagine the answer probably is no. Um, uh, well, actually, it's... it's uh, is mainly yes, to be honest. I think they've they've worked reasonably well, but obviously they've been subject to a degree of external strain that probably wasn't uh, expected at first. I think the TCA arrangements, as far as I can tell, um, are working reasonably well. I, indeed, I think the TCA itself uh, is working effectively. Um, and um, there are certainly some bits of it as we've discussed that can be sanded off, and perhaps those groups are discussing it, but I think they are working uh, effectively. Even the withdrawal agreement is a different matter. I think even within the withdrawal agreement, the, um, the Joint Committee and many of the specialised committees um, have worked effectively. They've been fora for different... Uh, perspectives being shared, most obviously on citizenship, uh, and even more obviously on, on Northern Ireland. But I, th I think they're doing the job. They are getting people talking. They were not, they're, not, um, uh, they're not bodies which are designed in themselves <coughs> to evolve the arrangements. That's got to come from outside, and obviously they're, they're working within a context in which that's, that's quite difficult. But I'm, I'm quite positive about it and I, I know obviously don't have direct experience but the the parliamentary forum the civil society forum um, are all up and running and probably within the um, the relatively formulaic expectations we have of bodies like that they are they're working reasonably well but I, 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 it's too soon to tell but but I think they they're working better than many people give them credit for thank you well that said if the current negotiations that are taking place resolve the outstanding difficulties and we get back to some more normal situation, I wonder if you could tell us, and Lord Mandelson too, whether you think that the present system of 32 committees and working groups established under the Withdrawal Agreement and the TCA um, is appropriate or whether you feel that it is overly complex. Perhaps I could ask Lord Mandelson first. Well, I think that the 30-odd uh, specialist committees and technical um, working groups, <coughs> I mean, they only take us so far. I mean, they are a vehicle for people to use, but they don't in themselves generate the sort of spirit or determination or desire uh, for, for, for partnership that we would like to see and the development of habits of working together to solve common problems. I mean, I mean where, where, where we have used um, 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 uh, sort of employed real cooperation, 
uh, for example, in respect of energy, you know, we can see so far the gains that are available. But there are many other areas in which uh, we've got to employ similar uh, uh, cooperation and, and develop the habit uh, of, of working together. I would rather us prioritize creating what I call that habit of cooperation and working together rather than at this stage looking at the, the structural aspects uh, of the TCA. It's too early uh, for that. Uh, we haven't given anything that we've put in place time enough uh, to operate and work as we think it should. Uh, the TCA, I think, will be reviewed in 2025 in any case. Um, and I hope that in the years between now and then, um, uh, that habit of working together would have grown so uh, that we will want uh, to take the uh, TCA forwards. The TCA, as it stands at the moment, is a basic, is a bare bones trade agreement for on on goods. It's really not a lot more uh, than that. But I would describe it as a ground floor, uh, not a ceiling. You know, the TCA is a dynamic uh, uh, construct which can. Uh, with the agreement of both sides be taken in, in a variety of different directions. We know that, for example, uh, foreign policy, security and defence issues uh, were not included in the original uh, agreement. And I think you know, one thing that we've learned from, uh, 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 from, uh, uh, from the experience of the continuing war uh, in, uh, in Ukraine uh, is that, you know, in that sphere of security and defence, there's a colossal amount more that, that unites us than divides us. We now, after all, have a common enemy uh, that unites us, but also that you don't win wars by WhatsApp. You, you know, they, you, you need really strong mechanisms and working structures, uh, which uh, uh, I think are likely to become permanent. Um, now, we might get on to the, this uh, area of, of defence and security in the course of, of the discussion, but that is an example of a key area, in my view, uh, where a dynamic <coughs> a trade and cooperation agreement uh, uh, can fulfil better its original aims when we come to review it. I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't spend time now, though, uh, on sort of structural institutional questions. Uh, I would put more time and energy into um, people meeting, leaders meeting, ministers meeting, uh, people meeting on different issues uh, or d concerning different challenges in different contexts. Um, uh, um, um, the recent meeting uh, in Prague is, is a very good example uh, of, of an occasion uh, which shows the advantages of bilateral meetings, for example, between our own Prime Minister and President Macron. I mean, what's flowed from that? It's unlocked uh, cooperation, for example, on size well. There are many areas uh, where we can unlock uh, <coughs> cooperation uh, as long as we have people meeting in good faith uh, in a trustworthy uh, <coughs> basis in the first place. Thank you. I must say I agree very much with the point you make about the habit of cooperation. And I think that it is on that basis that so much else can be built. Lord Frost. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I basically agree with, with what a lot of Lord Mendelssohn said. I think the habits of cooperation are important and um, uh, the more of it that happens, the better. Um, I don't think that you know, talking does not dissolve fundamental national interests, but it certainly um, makes them a bit easier to to manage. Um, certainly, no problem personally with uh, UK ministers showing up at councils if they're invited and you know, joining those discussions. I think it all makes sense. I do think. I mean, you're right. There are a lot of committees and so on that that run the the TCA, but that's because it is quite a big agreement and. Um, I, I think it has got a bit established <coughs> somehow that uh, this is a bare bones agreement. It isn't. Um, it includes 
services, for example, legal services. We work very hard to get good provisions there. It includes provisions on airlines. It includes provisions on lorries. It has a huge law enforcement chapter. It has a fisheries agreement. It has a very deep social security agreement, including health cooperation uh, uh, and the continuation of the uh, the, 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 the arrangements for mutual treatment of health, which we work very hard to get. So there is a lot in this agreement. It's a lot broader than most trade agreements, in fact. And I think it is right that this, it's inevitable, actually, there's going to be lots of complexity uh, in running it. I, I mean, I know a little bit about trade agreements. David. Indeed. Um, <laughs> I think we both do. Th this, is, this, is, this is a goods agreement, it's not really. You speak so, up, sorry. This is a goods agreement, not a services uh, agreement. I mean, yes, we have a memorandum um, uh, of understanding on financial services and the handling of VAT, but it hasn't been ratified as far as I know. Um, it, it, th th there are one or two little small bites of <laughs> cherry, but th th this is not a substantive service uh, agreement in services trade. So I, th I think the, um, the 500 page schedule attached to the, uh, the agreement um, on services, uh, you know, we would certainly wanted to do more, uh, certainly wanted to do better, but uh, I think it is better than zero by quite a lot. Thank you very much. In the, in the same sort of vein, perhaps we could move to Lord Lamont. <laughs> Well, I think perhaps my question has been partially covered, or at least Lord Mandelson partially covered. I mean, the question was, would there be any benefit to holding regular summit-level meetings between the UK and the EU of the type that the EU holds with some other countries and that the UK has already agreed to hold with some partners such as Germany? But perhaps we could get Lord Frost's view on that, and if Lord Mandelson has anything to add, he'll add it. But I think he made his point in reply to Lord Tugendhat. I think, um, uh, yes, probably could be helpful uh, to have regular summits. Um, they do tend to be, um, uh, you know, in the more sort of dignified rather than efficient uh, bit of the spectrum as far as the, uh, the collective constitution is, is concerned. But I think they can be a useful focal point. I probably wouldn't say the most, they're the most important thing at the moment. I think the most important thing is getting the habits of cooperation going in other ways and um, having enough cooperation, not just in the committees, but day to day uh, through the missions uh, and, um, uh, and so on. So I think that would be the priority, but I certainly wouldn't say no. I, I could easily see it getting established. It just probably isn't the immediate priority. I think Lord Manderson was saying, wasn't saying no, but was saying he thought informal contacts were more valuable. I think also bilateral contacts between uh, our Prime Minister and leading ministers and those in France and Germany, yeah. uh, Norway, Eastern Europe, I mean, in different ways, if you think, um, trying to think of an example, we have a, a defence um, partnership, a cooperation with Poland, for example. We've developed that. Th these are the sorts of things I would like to see. I mean, I think that a UK-EU summit might have a symbolic value. Um, it would have to be very carefully prepared. Um, I think it, it, it might then, you know, that, that the goodwill, if it engenders that, might sort of cascade downwards into other relationships. But I would like to see, um, um, you know, London, Paris, London, Berlin, London, Prague, London, Rome. I would like to see these bilateral relations developing in a whole plethora of different areas. And then I would like to see much more London, Brussels. No, so I'm not saying that we should develop bilateral relations with national capitals of our member states at the expense of Brussels or in order to divide and rule um, uh, member states, on the contrary, uh, but I think that bilateral relationships uh, will in time feed in uh, to a better all-round relationship uh, between London and Brussels, the UK and the EU. I make one follow-up point uh, on that. I mean, I agree with all, with, with all of that. I think it is important that if those things are going to happen, we have enough people to manage those relationships. 
and um, uh, that means uh, certainly in the Foreign Office probably beyond that you need um, sufficient ministers, sufficient senior officials, sufficient envoys if you like who are empowered by um, uh, ministers or the Prime Minister to build those relationships and be in place over time, not rotate rapidly, um, allow them to, to happen. And I think that is a change in our practice that we should try and get established now we've left the EU. Um, we do not have, you know, we essentially have the same number of ministers, the same cast of ministers, the same ways of doing things in our diplomacy as we did before. And I think that, that has to change. Um, Lord Hannay is going to come in in a second, but can I just ask you about that? Because surely d during the time when we were members of the EU, ministers were engaging in this type of uh, in intercourse naturally. And as it were, that time has been given back to them because they're not. And what we're talking about is sort of re-engaging in a process. So would we actually need to increase things dramatically or are we just going back to the position quo ante? So I think um, obviously within the EU, um, ministers and senior officials and others met a whole bunch of people all at the same time through the EU structures. And that wasn't the only thing, but that's how a lot of the, the contact happened. Now we've got to do a lot of it bilaterally that involves travel, it involves preparation. And when you put all that work in, you've only done it with one country. And I, I just think that requires more resource and more effort uh, if we're going to make it work than uh, it has done before. Thank you for that clarification. Lord Hannay. But I just wanted to pick up on that and ask you, you've had recent experience of this, uh, Lord Mandelson, more, less recent experience of it, but plenty of experience. Uh, a huge amount depends on the coordination of the British government's policies under the authority of whoever is the Prime Minister in a uh, machinery usually to be found in the Cabinet Office. As far as I can tell, most of the existing machinery we had was simply abolished and has never been re properly replaced. Uh, what's to be done about that? Uh, because we have to recognise reality, don't we, that in this day and age the Prime Minister does call the shots on all these matters, but it doesn't work if the other departmental ministers aren't working in a coherent way together. Yeah, I, I don't think our internal coordination arrangements um, on European and semi-European business have worked well, um, certainly since the referendum and probably a bit before that. I think um, uh, the habits, the internal habits of transparency of information, about clarity when decisions were taken, what those decisions were so people could act on them, all that habit has been lost. And I don't think you can uh, point out one government particularly for, for being responsible for that. I think it has been a gradual deterioration over the last decade or more, for, to be honest, of how the machinery has worked. Thank you very much. We move to Lord Faulkner, who's participating in a hybrid fashion. Lord Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Lord Chairman. Um, I'd like to ask um, both our witnesses their view about the um, that UK participation <coughs> excuse me, in other multinational organisations, such as the Council of Europe, the United Nations, maybe the World Trade Organisation and the G7. How should our institutional, institutional cooperation with the EU relate to that? In, in, in my view, um, we should uh, know what the EU is doing multilaterally. We should uh, uh, try and shape where it's possible to do so uh, the positions that the EU uh, arrives at uh, informally through uh, a discourse and transparency between us. Uh, we should seek uh, uh, outside the European Union to leverage the strength uh, of uh, the EU within multilateral uh, institutions uh, where, we find, where we have an identity of interest uh, and opinion. Uh, I, I think that what's happened is that, you know, almost as a matter of a principle or dogma, uh, many uh, who supported Brexit uh, feel that any sort of contact uh, with the European Union is a sort of 
is a form of entrapment. You know, that somehow the sort of tentacles of the beast are going to sort of reach out and invade us back into the European Union. Well, you know, that ain't going to happen, and nobody's suggesting it will. I'm talking about pure practicality, how to advance the interests and the position of the United Kingdom. And just as we seek to influence the United States, uh, and uh, try where we can to leverage the strength of the United States to advance UK interests, I believe we should do the same in relation to the European Union. Thank you. Lord Frost? Yes, um, I, I basically agree with that. I think um, we should be um, obviously making sure we know what the major players are doing um, in multilateral organisations. We are likely to find ourselves working with the EU and other Western countries more than others for obvious reasons and um, uh, I think that is obviously entirely natural. Um, I think the two things I would, would add really are that um, I think it's important that, our, that we shouldn't get into a position where we are always dealing with the EU first and our first <coughs> assumption and solution to every problem is to ask what is the EU doing. I think you know we should be a bit more sophisticated than that and knowing and talking to the EU is extremely important but it shouldn't always automatically be our, our first, the first thing we think uh, about everything and I think at times it has been that. I agree with Lord Mandelson that I think at times there has been a sort of overzealous wish to kind of avoid contacts almost with uh, with the EU and its institutions. That's not my view and I hope what I've said already shows that's, that's not my view. Um, but I think there has been maybe overcorrection uh, by some uh, in places uh, as, as a result of, of, of Brexit. The last thing on all this, I, I, you know, we are an independent player now and I think there is still a bit of a tendency to undervalue what we can do internationally and in these institutions. Obviously we aren't a player like the Americans, the Chinese or the EU on trade issues, for example in the WTO, but we are still a very big player and if you look at the countries that do have influence in the WTO, they are, uh, you know, countries like Canada, Australia, uh, etc. They have influence. They're, they're not at the, the, the very top, but they are very significant players, and we should not underrate ourselves and our ability to make things happen in these these organisations. Thanks very much. It's a very interesting answer, Lord Cross. Thank you. thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And we move to Lord Fox, who's also participating in a hybrid fashion. Lord Fox. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Properly. Ah, oh, good. Uh, the reason I'm having some problems in communication is that I'm in Strasbourg at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And some concern has been expressed here by members of Parliament from all the country about the meeting in Prague that Peter, that Lord Mandelson described earlier on. Uh, now, whereas our Prime Minister has said that this is just going to be a sort of informal relationship with no secretariat, uh, they've already fixed meetings in uh, Moldova, in Spain, and then uh, later in the United Kingdom. And it's beginning to look as if it is uh, a sort of growing permanent organization. Um, how do you see it developing, both of you? And uh, do you see uh, the fears here that it'll become, that it'll eclipse the Council of Europe and take over uh, as a genuine fear? I don't see why the council should feel threatened, uh, uh, George, at all. Look, I, I personally welcome um, the um, uh, the establishment of the European political community. Um, I think uh, it, it's a, a good forum, uh, a potentially a mechanism to advance cooperation on uh, on energy. Or, um, um, security, migration, uh, and, and other issues. Um, I also think it's a chance uh, for us to, you know, rebuild trust uh, with our neighbours. 
um, and to sort of foster a, a more uh, strategic and common interest uh, amongst uh, all uh, Europe's nations. So I, I look at it positively. Um, I think we've also uh, got to um, not anticipate, but consider at least the risk that we get another sort of America <coughs> first president <coughs> moving into uh, into the White House. Um, I mean, you know, should uh, America ever move in a direction which adversely affects us uh, in Europe, uh, puts a question mark uh, over uh, our alliance with the United States or the or America's security guarantee, then we are all of us going to have to think in a rather deeper and more profound European way uh, than we have done uh, previously. Now, Britain is going to have to find its place in that consideration, that forum. We're not members of the European Union. Uh, we need some sort of locus in some sort of uh, uh, European uh, uh, um, uh, 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 body. I'm not absolutely sure that the European political community is going to be it. I know that some say um, that eventually it will need um, a, a secretariat. Um, I don't think that secretariat can or should be the European Commission, by the way, because this community is an amalgam uh, of countries inside the EU, outside the EU, once in the EU, no longer in the EU. So it wouldn't be appropriate for the Commission to, to play that role, but it may be that uh, a secretariat of some sort um, uh, uh, will be needed uh, in due course. Let's see how it evolves. Let's see how it develops. Uh, what one thing is for sure is that the prime, our Prime Minister, you know, when eventually she was persuaded that it was a good idea to participate in this meeting, seemed to, you know, be very relaxed and very at home in the uh, meeting. And I think her presence was very well received by others. I think that's significant, and it's something on which we should build. There was a feeling that the European Commission had taken over that meeting. Uh, in fact, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe was not invited to the meeting, nor the Secretary General of NATO, although it was dealing with security. And it looked as if the uh, Commission were trying to sort of uh, take ownership of it. Is, is that a concern? Well, I think that would be a mistake. Um, I, 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 I just don't think that uh, the Commission uh, can play that role. I think if you're going to uh, develop the community and it's going to have a founding document and it's going to agree that and it's going to establish other bona fides, you know, you have to recognise that this community is not simply an extension um, or, or expression of the European Union and therefore I don't believe its commission can provide its administration. Good. What, what did Lord Frost think? Mm. Well, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think it is, um, you know, a potentially useful body. It seems right that Europeans should have a way of, of getting together um, in a reasonably systematic way nowadays. Uh, I think it was right for the PM to, to go to it. I don't see much risk of it overshadowing the Council of Europe. Um, to be honest, I mean, that's such a well-embedded institution with its own treaty, obviously the court, everything that goes with that. I, I just think it's a different uh, it's a different kind of thing, uh, and I, I just don't see that risk at the moment. I do, um, I, I think some small level of institutionalisation may be necessary. It is possible for bodies, international bodies, to kind of work with minimal um, secretariats, the G7 has done that for many years, uh, G20 obviously, um, but I think some sort of secretariat probably makes sense. I agree it can't be the commission, it has to be done uh, in some other way. Um, and um, uh, you know, any sense of deep institutionalisation um, or 
uh, a sort of the kind of teleology that surround has surrounded the EU will just sort of scare off participants and and should be avoided. So I think it's it's an interesting start. Let's see where it goes and keep it complementary to everything else that's going on in Europe. It does get established. Do you think it will play a key part in the UK EU relations? I've got a slightly different view, George. I think it won't play a key part in UK-EU relations. I do, however, think that the establishment of the community, if that happens, um, is a very big opportunity uh, for, for Britain. And I think we have a, quite an incentive uh, to make it work. I keep saying... Thank you, that, um, Just to add, I, mean, I, I keep saying that my... The point of Brexit was not to have bad relations with all our neighbours, it was to have a different kind of relationship with all our neighbours. And this seems to be a way of uh, allowing that to develop. Thank you very much, both of you. That's very helpful answers. Yes, thank you. And um, we move to Lord Wood. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming. I wanted to ask about the impact of Brexit on foreign policy and security cooperation. So. I think Viscount Trenchard is going to ask about uh, Ukraine in a minute, where that's one, one set of issues. But more medium term, maybe, what do you see as the impact of Brexit on the possibility of foreign security defence cooperation? And I guess one of the issues in particular is there's a lot of concern, as you both know, about PESCO, about European uh, procurement cooperation um, excluding the UK in the medium term, or maybe even shorter than the medium term. Uh, what's your, how worried are you about those sorts of things uh, in terms of continuing involvement with the UK in defence uh, work inside the EU? Well, I, I, I think we should be pragmatic about this. We, we obviously kept out of the <coughs> negotiations in 2020. Um, we took the view that we did not want to see an institutionalised UK-EU foreign policy relationship at that point. Um, that may not be the case for forever, um, but I think a lot can be done just by normal UK EU diplomacy, the kind of normal sort of contacts that that happen at all kinds of levels in assuring foreign policy coordination and uh, um, alignment of the direction of travel where that's that's necessary. I think on things like PESCO, where obviously I think there is a it, there's a process underway uh, on that, um, and on similar kinds of EU arrangements. I think we should just be pragmatic uh, about this. If, if it ends up that we are a bit player in essentially EU arrangements with very little ability to, uh, to, to sort of affect it or have our own interest play, that's, that's one thing. Um, if it is taking part in arrangements that other third countries are part of and, and are a sensible way of allowing um, uh, uh, a particular area of competition of cooperation to develop that's something different and I think you know PESCO probably leans a bit more to the second than the first at the moment so I, I, I think we should have no prejudices uh, about this um, as long as we are maintaining freedom of action and able to protect our own interests that's how I would look at it. Just to follow up before I go to Lord Mandelson you, you don't see the need for um, any new institutional arrangements to develop in order to give birth to a, a new relationship on foreign policy or security cooperation? I don't really. Um, I mean, I w like I say, I, w I wouldn't say that it would never be necessary, but I think, um, uh, I, I, I think it is, I think there are two things going on. One, um, diplomacy and foreign policy cooperation isn't always well suited to the kind of formal institutional arrangements that the EU typically does. They very rapidly become um, sort of dignified rather than efficient and all the um, the real contacts happen uh, in other ways and I do think from my perspective from the government's perspective that I was in um, we did not want to see established immediately after Brexit a whole set of arrangements that would as it were keep us in the orbit and um, mean that the first thing we thought of presented with foreign policy uh, problem is what is the EU going to do and how are we going to influence it. That is an important part of any problem, but it shouldn't be the first thing. Um, as soon as, you know, over time we will get used to being a genuinely independent actor on the world stage
which you know will develop our own interests more effectively. We will co cooperate in different kinds of ways, and maybe these, this, the institutionalised relationship will become a bit easier in that sort of context. I mean, my view is that um, our ability, the scope for us to act as a truly independent actor on the world stage, is is very constrained. Uh, that's why we uh, channel. Uh, so much into the collective security arrangements of NATO. Uh, it's why uh, uh, we have, and I think at times in the future, on a sort of practical, pragmatic basis, find ways of cooperating uh, with the European Union. I mean, th there are areas um, uh, uh, of activity in Africa, the Horn of Africa, uh, for example. There are issues in Africa to do with terrorist threats and illegal migration, you know, where Britain has played quite an important role. We've even led uh, uh, on uh, 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 efforts in these missions uh, in the Horn of Africa uh, and elsewhere. And we've done that through collaboration, uh, you know, as members of, of the European Union. And I think we need to find a way back uh, to do that. Now, um, we are... Um, um, uh, I mean, the, our leadership in NATO, uh, the NATO HQ, is definitely one part of um, uh, Brussels uh, in which the UK is very definitely well thought of. Uh, I think the role that we've played in respect of Ukraine has generated uh, a lot of respect uh, and goodwill uh, uh, for Britain amongst the member states of the uh, European Union. But we do lack a vehicle, uh, some sort of structured uh, way uh, in, uh, uh, in which we can um, uh, uh, op uh, operate in future uh, uh, with uh, the European uh, Union. And I think we have to be quite careful about this because the <coughs> EU and the United States are definitely <coughs> on a mission to create very structured ways uh, of, of working, of assembling strategic views uh, of our Western interests uh, in the world. I think of two, the US-EU Security Forum now. We have no structural mechanism way of uh, uh, taking part of that in that and influencing it. The Trade and Technology Council, the TTC, originally uh, the idea of the, uh, uh, of the Commission, which the United States administration took some time to embrace, has now done so with real gusto and enthusiasm. Why? Because suddenly you have a mechanism for US-EU cooperation, convergence of policy, thrashing out what we're going to do, for example, in relation to sanctions, uh, 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 with, uh, against Russia uh, because of uh, Ukraine. Also, what we're going to do to limit or to operate export controls of critical technology uh, to China, uh, how we're going to pursue technological sta international standards that reflect the interests of the United States and Europe rather than have them you know, imposed through hyperactivity uh, by China. Now, where is Britain in all this? I mean, frankly, we're observers, we're spectators, because we have no institutional mechanism that connects us uh, or binds us in uh, to, to, to these new arrangements. And don't underestimate them. Yes, they may fall by the side, by the wayside, if there's another president uh, who takes a different view uh, of, of Europe, in which case we've got much bigger problems on our plate than, 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 uh, than what Britain's future role is going to be. Those will be existential questions uh, uh, for, us, uh, for us all. But in the meantime, uh, this EU-US uh, collaboration is thickening uh, in a whole number of different areas, and we're not part of it. Lord Frost? Well, yeah, go ahead, back to Lord Frost. Maybe he wants to come back on some of that, maybe. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, um, I, I take a slightly different view, I suppose, um, on how um, influence happens 
uh, in the world. And um, I think that um, it is more than just being part of institutions and um, uh, trying to sort of project your will within them. I think um, on a lot of foreign policy is about what you say and how quickly you act and how much of a lead you give. I think speed and clarity and decisiveness count for, for quite a lot. Um, I think we've been, there's a kind of implicit view of the EU that um, it always knows what it wants to do internationally um, and is clear about how it wants to act. And I don't think that's, that's always the case. There clearly are very significant divisions within the EU that in different circumstances, I think we would have seen play out quite a lot and made the EU a much less effective uh, international player than, than you know, it's, it's, it, it just gradually got its act together over Ukraine, but it wasn't obvious it was going to be like that. So I think speed, clarity, and what you do with your own country counts. If we are successful economically, as I believe we will be, if we are become serious defence spenders, if we spend a lot on defence research, um, and so on and so on, <coughs> we will be a significant player and we will be part of discussions that, that matter. Institutions are part of it, but they are only part of it, I would say. Thank you very much. Lord Little. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I suppose I'd like to follow on directly from what we've just been discussing, uh, particularly in the context of major international crises. Um, uh, so, uh, David, to you, I suppose, is um, uh, when you're talking, when we were talking about Ukraine, we've clearly managed to play uh, a big role in terms of military support uh, for the Ukrainians. Um, but in areas like sanctions and even more in areas like energy policy, isn't it the case that we are a bit on the sidelines of what um, Europe is deciding? Uh, that's, uh, and thinking forward, you know, the, the, in the next 10 years, we may face a major crisis with China. Um, uh, where would Britain be? How would Britain fit into, for instance, whatever trade policy the EU decided uh, on China? Would we just go along with it? Or how would we influence it? Uh, and can we establish relationships that enable us from outside the EU uh, to influence what are clearly critical decisions uh, that really matter to us. Mm. So I, I think if we're looking at the Ukraine problem, obviously I haven't been in government since that's happened, so um, yeah. I'm a commentator like, like everybody else, I guess. Yeah. Um, obviously we are uh, to some extent on the sidelines of EU decision making because we're, we're not a member of the, the EU and we um, I think that it is inevitable it will be a bit like that. I don't think the um, EU's record over this period has been um, particularly stellar. I mean a lot of the problems that we have come from some of the uh, appalling misjudgments that have been made by some EU member states about energy supply in recent years about which we have been uh, critical um, and uh, I think it's going to take quite a lot of time for them to uh, correct that and I think it's right that um, if it is indeed our focus that our focus should be um, you know very much on our own resilience and making sure that we can get through these these periods as, as well as trying to influence what the EU does similarly on sanctions uh, you know I, I think you could make a case that um, the need for consensus within the EU on sanctions uh, effectively has weakened them over the last year. That you could argue that 25 or 26 member states proceeding on their own would have been able to put in place quicker uh, and more effective and more far-reaching sanctions than this process that's been blocked at every stage uh, and gradually the uh, the country concerned has been one round. So I, I don't think it's as straightforward. I think the picture is, is, is more complicated. I think we have given leadership 
Um, we've stood up for all our own interests, and I think it's right that we're focused on our own resilience. Can we influence the EU from outside as part of a crisis? Well, I hope so. Uh, you know, I like to think we we influence the Americans and others, and the way we do it is by having the you know very deep day to day uh, relationships, <coughs> the, the frequent contacts, the understanding. Um, and the sense of what each other's interests are, and that that is how we should be trying to do cooperation with the EU, and we that is going to require effort on our part. And as I said earlier, I'm not sure we're resourcing it as well as we should, but we should be doing it and trying it because it will be very important. I, 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 mean, I agree with about the, the China. Uh, well, come, let, let me come on yeah. to China in a moment, if I may. I yeah. mean, obviously, I agree with the impulse that we should stand up for our own resilience, for example, in respect of energy. But, you know, when uh, push comes to shove, you know, we may need a little bit more than that. We may need a little bit more cooperation. We may need a little bit more energy. We need, might need a little bit more interconnectedness. We may have to rely on our neighbours, in other words, in extremis. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone uh, in Europe, ourselves or member states of the European Union, uh, can afford to throw stones in glass houses. Uh, I mean, whilst you know, certain member states of the European Union were deepening their dependence on Russian gas, uh, 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 very foolishly, you know, we were closing down in Britain our gas storage facilities. You know, when was that? 2012, 13? I mean, crazy. Uh, you know, w we have a lot of trouble with onshore wind, uh, as we know. Um, uh, we seem to be incapable of building, you know, civil nuclear power stations once a year for 10 years, as was promised. Uh, so, you know, and none of us have got energy right, and I, I would be pretty cautious about imagining that in all circumstances, you know, we can rely, we can stand up for our own resilience. Uh, I think we need um, uh, some more safety nets than that. I think on China, you know, my view is sort of pretty simple. Um, uh, I would. Uh, when it comes to China, uh, uh, rather we um, uh, coordinated and collectivized our approach to China uh, than stand separately alone and allow ourselves to be targeted and picked off by China. Uh, because, you know, look, we're not the most important country um, in the Chinese universe. Um, but, you know, we're a fairly large economy. Uh, we have uh, strong trade links and investment links uh, between the UK and China. We're not sort of unimportant, uh, but we shouldn't exaggerate our importance. And certainly when it comes to... We will become uh, less important. I'm sorry? Sorry, I had a big of No, no, <laughs> I didn't hear you. Um, um, uh, when, it, when it comes to... Um, you know, shaping uh, our, our future approach to China. Look, we have to um, uh, secure ourselves in a whole variety of different ways towards China, but we also need to engage uh, with China. Uh, that's what the new dynamic in the relationship between China and the West uh, requires, and I'd rather we did that as part of a you know, collective uh, Western approach and strategy than think that we can, you know, form our own sort of stance, uh, exercise any real influence uh, over China and China's position in the world by separating ourselves uh, from others. Thank you very much. Lord Hannay wanted yes, to come I, in. Here. I just wanted to ask you both to comment, particularly Lord Frost, because I think uh, Lord Manson has already, to some extent, answered the question. Don't you think that if we insist all the time on the necessity that to look after our own interests in a separate way, we make ourselves quite a lot more vulnerable. Uh, over the years, uh, as one of the members of the European Union, we acquired a good deal of invulnerability as a result of the fact that the European Union was rather a, a large beast and nobody wanted to kick it on the shins too much. Uh, if we insist that we are going to be separate and different, 
uh, will we not be creating ourselves in the sort of conditions that Lord Mandelson was referring to of a tension with China of great vulnerability? I'm not arguing that we should therefore always do exactly the same, but we are surely creating a vulnerability there without perhaps realising that's what we're doing. So I, I, um, I think there are different ways of, of looking at this. I would... Um, so obviously there is a risk of um, uh, divide and rule or us ending up on our own um, and taking a particular policy view. I, I would also say that I think um, while we were in the EU, um, of sometimes my experience was that um, our policy was to avoid uh, taking a robust view on questions and to hide in the pack. And I think over time that stopped us thinking hard about problems that we should have been thinking hard about as a country. So I think these things play both ways. I think if you're, if you're thinking, just, just to expand the discussion slightly, this question of resilience, I'm, I'm obviously not saying that we should have regard to our own interests independently and <coughs> indifferently to anybody else's. You obviously do increase resilience by um, connections with others. That's that's obvious. But I think you also have to take a realistic view about whether you can rely on those connections or not. And, um, you know, I was certainly quite deeply burned by the um, uh, very... Um, uh, fraught atmosphere uh, over the vaccine issue uh, 18 months ago and the, we discovered in that case that it was every man, every country for itself, whatever the legal niceties and I think we just have to be realistic that in moments of extreme crisis and extreme stress um, you can't necessarily rely on interconnectors you can't necessarily rely on uh, every legal framework you're part of, you have to make sure that you are doing your best to cover yourself. Thank you very much. I, I would, we're likely to finish about 10 minutes late. I hope that's agreeable for the two of you, but um, it's very interesting indeed, and it would be a great pity not to finish off the question set. And I wondered, therefore, if we could move to Lord Trenchard. Thank you, Lord Chairman. Um, I would like to ask about... Um, the effectiveness, how effective the cooperation between the UK and the EU has been in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Has UK-EU cooperation worked well? Would it have worked better if we had been part of the US-EU institutional defence and security arrangements, which have been discussed? Or if we had been committed to PESCO, which we're not, or has it worked effectively because the UK was free at the point of invasion to react immediately and to adopt a leadership role which otherwise would have been compromised? I mean, that, that's my view, uh, your latter um, of the choice. Uh, obviously, I haven't been directly involved in, in this, but um, it's, that is my impression. If I... I think that a lot of, if we've been part of the EU, a lot of diplomatic effort, I mean really a lot over the last six, nine months, would have been devoted to showing up in Brussels, trying to influence what was going on there, um, spending a lot of time on that, probably with what rather limited effect. And I personally think that would have come at the expense of uh, talking to others and hard thinking about the situation and trying to influence it in in other ways. That's just my view. I, I, I think that's <coughs> the case. Um, but of course, you never know with counterfactuals. And Lord Mandelson, would you well, concur? I, I, I think Lord Frost is exaggerating, uh, for whatever purpose, um, uh, the slowness <laughs> of the European Union to react to the invasion. It is certainly true that when it came to sanctions, um, you know, United States uh, senior officials flew into Brussels with a plethora of very well worked out and detailed uh, arrangements. 
um, uh, for sanctions and met the relevant commissioner who thought, you know, they were just going to have a preliminary and general chat. Mm. Uh, whereupon the Americans spread, got their spreadsheets out <laughs> across the table uh, and, um, you know, we were off with a rather more momentum than perhaps some in yeah. the Commission had initially uh, anticipated. But, you know, I, I think the bigger issue, frankly, that y Europe and we have got to consider um, uh, when we coordinate action um, uh, like our aid for Ukraine uh, in their resistance of, of the Russians, uh, which will be done primarily, obviously, through NATO, is a defence industrial dimension. And that is how we develop um, uh, weapons systems uh, that are interoperable, uh, that, that are easily moved. I was very struck um, when I met and discussed this with Chancellor Scholz in Berlin in um, July. And uh, we're having an informal private conversation. Uh, uh, but I'm sure he won't mind if I uh, say that the, the early German <laughs> problems was not only a paucity of supply, because the German military capability had been run down over two-plus two uh, decades. That, of course, is now going into reverse. And by the way, I think Britain needs to cooperate with Germany in the build-up of its military capability and help shape it and also possibly mm -hmm. supply it. Um, but the, the issues that Germany was wrestling with was not only that they didn't have enough to supply to help the Ukrainian resistance, um, there were great issues of adaptation of their systems and interoperability, uh, which you, know, you would have thought uh, would have been thought through uh, in their inception and not when they were most needed at a time of war. Um, you know, through uh, proper NATO uh, collaboration. Now, in my view, the uh, EU is going to learn lessons uh, uh, from uh, Ukraine. I think they're going to want to step up and do better uh, in the future uh, in such circumstances. Uh, I think chiefly that the European Union is going to form new linkages to NATO and to the United States. Uh, but it's also going to develop, in my view, um, a defence industrial um, uh, strategy and rolling out of, uh, 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 of resource and coordination, uh, which I think it would suit our books militarily um, uh, and uh, um, uh, economically uh, to be part of where we can, uh, rather than just, you know, stepping aside and not being part uh, of what is going to be a quite significant ratcheting up of European defence industrial cap uh, strategy and military capability. Um, thank you. That's very interesting. And you've actually gone on to the extension to my question, which was going to be how successful do you both think that cooperation with the EU has been in various areas of, co of the cooperation? And the provision of munitions was one that I was going to refer to, which you've already mentioned. What about the provision of hospitals and medical equipment, the implementation and maintenance of sanctions? Uh, and Lord Mandelson, you already re referred to the lessons which you expect the EU has learned as far as munitions and military equipment is concerned. <clears throat> so could I also, just to finish up, I'm trying to put three, four questions <laughs> into one. Um, are we, what other lessons have we learned from the cooperation over Ukraine? And are we confident that the EU will hold together through this winter? I mean, Germany need Germany's dependence on EU gas, or sorry, on Russian gas, has been so much greater than, for example, France, which relies largely on nuclear, that are, is the EU going to hold together and maintain sanctions through the winter? And perhaps, Lord Frost, you could start. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so, uh, is the answer. 
Um, of course, it, it depends how extreme the crisis in its various ways yet becomes, um, uh, which is only partly in our, our own hands. But I would expect that, yeah, the EU is going to show solidarity on this, having gone uh, as far as it, it has, precisely because the, the, the crisis is an extreme one. Um, uh, I, I think um, you know, I, I'm less convinced probably of its uh, kind of ability to learn from experience in these sort of areas and really reform and change its, its internal arrangements to, to avoid these problems again. But then that's, that's sort of their problem, not, not ours, uh, I guess. Um, but I think it, you know, it is, there are very considerable strains within the EU which are often not commented on as much as they should be, but all the same, the strength, the, the force of solidarity and cooperation within the EU is always very strong and so far has proved to be the stronger of those two forces. I agree with Lord Frost. I, we shouldn't underestimate um, EU solidarity, but even also equally, if not more so, an absolute determination. Uh, uh, to uh, see Putin defeated. I mean, this is of such a massive strategic interest uh, uh, to Europe. Uh, I, I think that, yes, there will be uh, very serious um, shortages. There will be very serious, there will be serious economic pain incurred. Um, uh, yes, the European Union will do everything it can to um, discourage or depress energy use uh, across Europe. It may or may not introduce price caps, uh, but there may be uh, rationing of energy uh, in, in certain member states, but I think they will be prepared to take on uh, uh, these, uh, uh, th this pain in pursuit of a bigger goal, and that is uh, resistance to and defeat of Putin's invasion. I think they're absolutely right to do so. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure we all agree with those sentiments. We come to our final question and Lord Lamont. Well, my final question or the final question is really about the so-called deepening relationship between NATO and the EU, which Lord Mandelson, I think, referred to. I must confess I wasn't really aware of this and I'm not sure whether he was referring just to the US-EU Security Forum or something much wider than that. Perhaps he could enlarge on that. But how does he think, or how do both of them think this affects Britain's relationship with NATO, um, and particularly in the context of Ukraine? And is there a risk here of the UK being excluded from important discussions? In the past, I mean, in my recollection, EU defence cooperation was always regarded as something of a threat to NATO, so I'm yeah. rather surprised at this development no, that Lord uh, Mandelson uh, is talking uh, about. Y yes. Uh, I mean, the, the British attitude uh, to it has always been that if Europe does more in any form, it will simply duplicate or dilute NATO. It, it, NATO's role and the anchoring of European security in the NATO alliance is in the Lisbon Treaty. It, it is an article of European law as well as faith uh, that NATO is the primary uh, uh, source and form of defence collaboration uh, for the EU's member states. The question, however, is whether the EU member states uh, can do more, step up, um, uh, strengthen uh, their contribution uh, to NATO's efforts <gasps> without diluting or duplicating. And uh, that, I think, is going to be an important lesson from Ukraine. And I don't think Britain, for example, should react in a negative or neuralgic uh, way. We have our place at the top table. You know, we are an undisputed uh, key member and provide important leadership to the NATO alliance. Nothing is going to affect that. Uh, and as long as the EU's um, uh, focus and the channeling of its efforts uh, are, are to strengthen uh, NATO's collective strength, then I believe Britain's interests will be protected. Mm. What form is this EU-NATO cooperation that the question implies uh, taking? 
I think it's uh, two things. It's, op it's operational, it's making the EU uh, 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 both uh, think more and more nimbly and quickly uh, about what EU member states have to do uh, in uh, uh, the context of uh, threats or emergencies, whether it be in uh, Ukraine or, 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 or Northern Africa. But secondly, it's got to develop, and it is. This is partly what sort of so-called strategic autonomy is about. It's got to do more to develop its own defence industrial strategy. It's got to rely less uh, on European member states sort of acting uh, separately uh, and apart in developing weapon systems which are not always interoperable or depending on the United States as many do uh, uh, it is about cr creating um, uh, um, uh, European sort of constructed produced uh, defence industrial uh, policies and investments in which they collaborate uh, together I mean the uh, um, aircraft combat system, uh, is an example uh, of that. Now we have our own uh, approach to that which at the moment involves Japan but also I think Sweden um, and Italy. Uh, yeah, but there's nothing, there, there's a but there's there's nothing a, very new about that. There, is there, there isn't, no. I mean, but, you but, know, that goes right back to the 1980s. Yeah, and, and look where and, it's got many of the multilateral <laughs> projects yeah. turned out to be much more expensive than buying America yeah. or developing on one's own. But there are economies of scale uh, which, which can be exploited. Uh, there are advantages and benefits from countries collaborating. They're doing so at the moment. They're doing so, France and Germany are doing so in the case of their own aircraft uh, combat system. Now, <coughs> what I'm saying is um, that um, uh, where there are economies of scale uh, to be exploited, when we can improve the sort of military interoperability and performance of what we're producing, uh, then I think Europe is much more, European Union is much more focused on that uh, than it uh, was before uh, the Ukraine uh, war. Uh, and I think it behoves uh, us to consider our own defence industrial strategies, certainly where we want and can do things by ourselves, but also where we can usefully collaborate uh, with others. But the key thing uh, is that we are all part of one single collective security alliance. It is called uh, NATO, and what we're doing should be joined up. Mm. Um, so uh, I think that three things really. First, I mean, obviously NATO um, has a new lease of life. I think it has been developing it actually for um, a few years, but but obviously this year has made a huge difference to perceptions of political importance to what NATO is there for and the importance of getting it right and Swedish and Finnish uh, applications to join as is, is the the symbol of that so I think um, I draw from that uh, what actually what I'd always thought which is that NATO does not have to worry about being undermined by a more sharply defined European security and defence identity. I think it should worry us if we were in it but we aren't in it any longer. Um, if Europeans feel that um, a clearer uh, sort of perception of uh, and arrangements for how they manage crises, clearer sense of their own strategic interests develops. Um, I don't think that's particularly likely to undermine NATO and shouldn't worry us particularly. I certainly don't think we should invest any effort in trying to stop it uh, as a country. Um, as regards sort of defence industrial policy, I mean, obviously that is very largely about... Uh, and this is all done through collaboration nowadays, um, I would, I mean, I'm not a big fan of industrial policy generally. I don't think it should be our presumption that it would be a good thing to be involved in um, EU procurement arrangements to buy uh, military kit. I don't think the track record really stands it up. I think we work out what our own interests are, where we want to cooperate on that. And as you say, that might be other partnerships. It might be buying American. It might be whatever. But again, I don't think... 
we should be worried if that's what the Europeans want to do. Um, it may very well not be in our interests. Well, thank you both very much indeed. We've used up 100 minutes of your time, and we're very, very grateful for what has been a thoroughly interesting <coughs> session with much food for thought. So with that, um, I declare the public evidence session over. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.